So th this is a talk called Complex Fe Features Made Easy. I'll put that in quotes with RxJS. I, I know that a lot of you here probably aren't Angular developers. Um, how many people here have used or heard of RxJS before? How about used RxJS? I said heard of. OK. So you're, you might feel a little bit during this talk like I feel in traffic here in India. Uh, I'm going to go through some features. I'm going to go through it very quickly. My expectation is not that everyone's going to walk out of here going, oh, I know how to implement everything just like Ben did with RxJS. My, my uh, intention here is that you get excited about RxJS and its features uh, and see some of the more powerful things you can do with it. So again, everything I'm going to show you is easy if you know RxJS. Uh, as he said, I am Ben Lesh. I am an engineer at Google. I am the RxJS project lead, and I'm also on the Angular team at Google. So what is RxJS? For those of you that did not raise your hands before, don't know what it is, uh, and maybe this might help some of you that already think you know what it is, I'm going to give you a very quick primer. Not going to go into a lot of depth. There's, there's a lot of other ways that, or a lot of other people who have done that before, including myself. Um, but observables, I'm going to mention those a lot. Observables are the primary thing, the main focus of RxJS. Uh, observables are a primitive type. And what they do is they give you zero to many values, and they push those values to you over time. Uh, they are cancelable in that you can tell it to stop sending you values. And they're lazy, meaning they don't do anything until you subscribe to them. So they're lazy in a way that a function is lazy. Like if you have a function, a function doesn't do anything until you call it. Observables do not do anything until you subscribe. So this is what subscribing to an observable looks like. You have an observable, you call subscribe on it, and then you generally give it one callback that says, oh, every time this next a value at me, it, it, it emits a value, I want to call this function and do something with it. In this case, I'm just logging. Uh, there are many ways to call subscribe. Uh, you can also provide a secondary argument for if there's an error. And this means this, the observable is going to stop uh, with an error, OK? And finally, this is a complete. So this is just saying, oh, the observable's done sending you values, and it was done successfully. Don't worry about it. But generally speaking, most people only ever call it with the one, honestly. Sometimes you can also call it with an observer, which is just an object with these three methods on it, and they're named like next, error, and complete. Uh, one interesting thing about this is the cancellation aspect of it. So observables give you this really ergonomic way to try to cancel and say, I don't want you to send me these values anymore. I want you to stop. And what it is, is it returns a subscription from the subscribe call. And later on, you can call unsubscribe, and that, will, that notifies the, the producer inside of that observable to stop sending values through the observable. So observables push values. Zero values or an infinite number of values over like an immediate amount of time or any amount of time. Uh, and it, they also will either complete successfully, then notify you of that, or they'll uh, notify you that there's been an error and stop. In any case, the, it'll tear down every, any resource that's underneath the hood. But that's what observables are about. And the important part about this for, for the talk today is observables are really collections of pushed events or values. So any, anything that, that you can imagine, an array or a web socket or whatever, can be now treated as a collection in this shape of an observable. And collections are very interesting, because then you get into things like category theory and whatever, and monads and end of functors and yada yada. Those are horrible words that don't really explain anything that well to anybody. Um, I'm sorry to any mathematicians that think they're wonderful words in the crowd. You can beat me up later. Um, but really what that means is collections, collections of anything, they can be filtered, which means narrowed down to smaller collections of the same type, or transformed into new collections of the same type, or uh, they can be joined with other collections into a new collection, or they can be split apart into different collections. Uh, there's just a, lots of different things are flattened. Flattened would be like if you have an array of arrays, you can make it just into an array, right? So these, these are various things you can do with collections. And it's not a property of an array. It's not a property of observables. It's a property of having a collection of things. If you have a collection of apples, you can make a collection of apple pies, right? Like it's just a property of collections. So the most common collection that we deal with every day is arrays. So we have these arrays, uh, and with an array, I can say, here's my array of numbers. I'm going to filter it down to all the numbers that are greater than four. I'm going to double those, those numbers, and then this reduce down here is going to sum it together. So that's kind of reducing it down into a single value, and I end up with 52. I can do exactly the same thing with Rx. You'll notice that I'm not dot chaining, what I call dot chaining here. 
dot filter dot map dot reduce. In RX six and, and above, we're doing pipe chain. It's the exact same concept. It's just functional. There's a lot of advantages to that. I'm not going to get into that too much here. But what you need to know is it takes the source observable and then passes it to the filter and returns an observable, then passes it to the map and returns observable and, and to reduce and so on. But we have the same exact sort of operations with observable that we have with array. But observables have a little bit more than that because arrays you can go over synchronously, but they're not asynchronous. Observables can do asynchronous things, which means there's this temporal element, this element of time. And because there's an element of time, we can do things like debounce them or throttle them. Or you can say, combine the latest value from this with the latest value of, of this other one, right? Just depending on when they arrived in time. Here's an example of something you might do with observables. Uh, this is a basic drag and drop. So here, everything that you see with a dollar sign in this case, that's a, that's a thing I, I lovingly dubbed Finnish notation after my friend Andre Stoltz, who lives in Finland, who kind of started popularizing this. But every variable you see with a dollar sign is a, an observable. And what we've got here is I'm making an observable of drag and drops from an observable of mouse downs. And I'm saying every time there's a mouse down, I want to map it to an observable of mouse movements. And I want to take all of those mouse movements until the observable of mouse ups emits one value. And I know that's how this works because I know it exhaust map and take and tilde. These are just part of, of RxJS. Uh, here's, here's another thing. So, so just uh, exhaust map just to kind of help see what it does. We're actually going to, this would be a, a button where you say, oh, I don't, I don't want this someone to hit the save button too many times and accidentally post data more than once. And so people disable it or whatever. This is another way you could disable it. You could just say, OK, so every time there's a save click, I'm going to map it into my post, which is an observable. And then I'm going to use exhaust map on it. What exhaust map says is wait for that observable to finish before you allow any other map, before you allow it to map to any other observable and subscribe to that. So it's going to map to that one, wait for it to be done before it allows another one to go through, no matter how many times you, you click the save button. So throttled auto suggest. So this is another one's called autocomplete or look ahead search or something like that. This is a kind of an idiomatic example in RX. There's a lot of, of uh, demos and tutorials that show this. But what you have is an observable of text inputs. So these are changes to like a text box on your screen. And we're saying we want to debounce those by 500 milliseconds, which means if someone changes it, then uh, wait a full 500 milliseconds before you allow it to pass. If they change it again before that 500 milliseconds, Drop the previous value, save the current value, wait a full 500 milliseconds for it to pass before it gets through. So it's just a way of you know, preventing you, you from spamming the server with requests. And then after that, we're going to switch map that to our get. And switch map is a little different in that if that get takes a long time and another, before it responds and another search is requested, it's going to unsubscribe from that one and subscribe to the new one that it maps to. So it's, it's uh, kind of the opposite of exhaust map. But the point of all this is composing asynchronous things is really what RxJS is good at. Um, it's, it's, it's the wheelhouse, and that's kind of what we want to get into here. Uh, RxJS, just so all of you know, can be used anywhere. I worked at Netflix prior to Google. At Netflix, I did not use Angular. I'm on the Angular team now at Google. Of course, I use Angular. Uh, at Netflix, I used RxJS with Node. I used RxJS in React, and I used RxJS with Ember. Uh, I can tell you factually, anywhere that can run JavaScript, can run uh, RxJS. So again, this is going to be an Angular app that I'm showing. Uh, I'm on the Angular team. I think I'd be doing my team a disservice if I showed you a React app, right? Uh, but I'm going to be updating features in an Angular app. And I'll try to give some context as far as React, because I know there's some React developers here as well. Uh, so remember that I said before, observers, ob observables require subscription. Uh, in Angular, we've got a really nice feature called pipe async. So you're going to see that a little bit. And what this does is it's part of the template. And it says, hey, when this, when this component mounts, I want you to subscribe to that observable. And every value it nexts out, I want you to place in the template right here. Just bind it out. And then when the component unmounts or is destroyed, uh, it's going to unsubscribe for you automatically. So you don't have to manage that subscription. So it's a very nice feature for reactive programming uh, as far as Angular goes. And if you have something like this, where there's like an if statement around it, so based on some Boolean, it's going to show or hide uh, or remove this part of the template, it'll actually subscribe when it's shown and unsubscribe when it's hidden. It'll do all of that for you. So it's a nice feature in Angular. 
If you ever want to see a talk on uh, Angular ba or RxJS basics, because uh, I'm not didn't really get into it in depth here. I did a talk already. You can watch a much chubbier version of me give the talk. Um, I'm I'm big in that, in that video, uh, and and it it goes into more detail about what RxJS does internally. So here's the app that we're going to update. Um, it's just this randomly generated news data uh, and just this dumb news feed app. And all it does right now is you load it up, it shows you the news. If you wanted to see the news again, you'd have to refresh it, basically. Uh, there's not even really a refresh button. You would just have to refresh the, the web page. Uh, so one of the features we want to add is like an auto refresh. So like on some interval, have the data refresh itself for you so you don't have to do that. Uh, and then the other one I want to add that's more exciting is drag down to reload. So if any of you have ever uh, used like Twitter before and you're on and you have to to drag down in order to reload, and you drag far enough, then if you, if you don't drag far enough and you let go, then it goes back up to the top. But if you drag far enough, then a spinner goes, and, and when the spinner goes away and animates back whenever you're done loading. There's lots of interfaces like that. That's what we're going to add to this. So the basic structure of our existing app, there's really only two pieces. There's a newsfeed service, uh, which is just a, a class that has, a, has an observable on it that gets data for us. And we have a latest news component, which is what's displaying the data. So the latest news component looks like this. Uh, I've got, just to kind of focus on, I don't need all the imports up there. I'm going to focus on this. Um, what I've got here is I've got this property at news dollar sign. That's an observable of the actual news. And you'll see it's an observable of arrays of news objects that's coming in. Um, and then I'm also injecting the news feed service down here. So Angular has dependency injection. It's going to provide this news feed service as a, as a private property. And the news feed service is actually what's providing the news observable. So, so our news observable is actually coming from the service at this point. Uh, here's what the template looks like. So you'll see up there, kind of like in the fourth line down, uh, I've got that pipe async. And I'm pipe async out that news property. So that's going to get that news array out. And then I'm using ng4 to kind of loop over that array of news whenever it comes out and just bind it out the title and you know whatever the string is and the timestamp and those sorts of things. So the newsfeed service right now looks like this. It's, it, I'm, I'm providing the HTTP client. And then all I've got in here is just a property with an observable on it. Now, that, that alone is kind of weird to people who are used to promises. Uh, promises, you generally have a method that returns a promise. The reason you have a method that returns a promise is because what you really wanted is a lazy promise, and promises are eager. They are not lazy. So you have to wrap them in a, in, uh, in a, a method and return them. In Observable's case, they don't do anything until we subscribe. So wrapping it in a function is just pointless. It's not going to do anything for us in this case. So this is a, an Observable that when you subscribe to it, will perform a get to get our news feed. It'll get the JSON out of it. It's got a catch error that just kind of logs the error to the console and forgets it. Uh, and I'm also sharing it. So if I have multiple subscribers to this, it shares the one HTTP request amongst multiple subscribers until that HTTP request is done. So we don't spam the server a whole bunch. But again. This is just a basic feed. That's all, that's all we needed to, to create this basic feed was that bit of code so far. Let's add the update interval uh, feature because that's the easiest one. But it, it is going to require us to refactor some things. So the first thing that we're going to need to refactor is, this, is the news feed service. So the news feed service looked like this before where we just had a property on it that was our observable of news arrays, right? And I'm actually going to rename that to load news. It's the same thing. I just renamed it to load news. And then I'm going to add another property that's a behavior subject it's called refresh. And the point of this is every time I next into this, this behavior subject, behavior subject is both an observer and an observable. So you can subscribe to it like an observable. And when you next a value into it, I'm going to map that to load news up above. And that becomes my new news dollar sign. So that news dollar sign is still providing the data that I, that I need for my view, but it's coming from every time I next into this behavior subject. And then one of the properties of behavior subject is the first time you subscribe to it, it gives you whatever the previous value was. In this case, I'm initializing it with null because I don't really care what the value is. But this will get us to where we were um, before already. But just now there's a way to trigger it to reload news data. And then we've got to go and we have to update our latest news component. So I'm going to add a refresh timer. So this timer function here comes from RxJS. And what this says is have a timer that starts at 0 milliseconds and then goes once every 30 seconds, so every uh, 30,000 milliseconds. Um, 
And what I want to do is have that trigger the, the reload of the news somehow. So how do we do that? Well, we, we know that we want the news to, to be the property, like the newsfeed news to be that news property. We're going to have to add something that, that uh, takes that refresh timer and next into our refresh behavior subject. So I'm going to add an ng on init. Uh, if you are a React user, this is roughly the equivalent of component did mount. And inside of there, I'm going to subscribe to my refresh timer and pass to it that behavior subject because it's got the same shape. It's an observer, uh, an observer. So it's got a next method on it. And every time the refresh timer emits, it's going to call next on that refresh, which loops back into our newsfeed service and triggers news to emit, which we've got on here as a property and is being bound out to their view. The other thing we need to do is we need to actually track the subscription. So I'm adding, since, since I said this dot subscription equals here, I need to add the subscription, otherwise TypeScript will be unhappy. And then finally, I need to add this ng on destroy. So this is the, this is the React equivalent of uh, component will unmount, right? So this, this is saying, so whenever this goes to unmount or, or destroy, I want to call unsubscribe in the subscription. So that'll stop that interval from ticking over and over and over again. You don't want that. You don't want to leave that running in the background. It's a memory leak. So again, just to, just to kind of go over and, and the, the, where the subscription part is, this is a, I, I have a whole slide specifically for this because this is a very common pattern uh, when you need to subscribe to something. If, if this were React, it would look basically the same, only it would be uh, component did mount and component will unmount instead of uh, on init and on destroy. Pretty much identical. So that's it. Um, just to recap what we did so far, and then I'm going to show it working. Uh, we, we used a behavior subject in our newsfeed service. So we kind of refactored our news, newsfeed service to reactively trigger that reload. And then we also, we also used a timer uh, in order, like on our component, and have that, you have that timer next into the refresh, the behavior subject that we put on our service. Uh, and then we, we manage our subscription in on init and on destroy. And here's it working now. I, I upgraded it to to three seconds so you can see it. Otherwise, you'd have to wait for half a minute. That would be really a boring talk on my part. I could dance or something, but. Um, yeah, so, it, so it's updating now. That's what we wanted. So just a few things. You notice we didn't touch the template at all, right? The template, we, we just, we, we renamed some things. That's probably why we had to do that, right? But mostly we just kind of did the small refactor and we kind of worked backwards. And that's a little hard to see in this case because it was, it was a small addition. But we, we kind of worked backwards through what we needed, um, starting at the template. So let's work on our pull down to reload feature. And this one's much more exciting uh, because it's much more complicated. So here's why it's complicated. You have to start when user touch starts. And you have to accommodate for the fact that the user could touch like twice, right? Uh, you also have to track their downward pull with some sort of icon. Uh, if they release before they get down to where the reload starts, you need to animate it back on its own. So there's an animation you have to deal with. Uh, if you get it down to where the reload starts, you need to trigger a reload, right? So then you have to deal with whenever the, the HTTP starts and ends. And then you also have to animate it back whenever it's done. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on here. There's three different uh, user provided events, touch start, touch move, and touch end. You have to worry about when the AJAX request starts and when it completes. And you also have to worry about animations. So I'm going to add a touch drag to load component. Uh, and this, the whole purpose of this component is it's going to control that, that icon that, that you're going to see on the screen. And it's also going to handle dealing with all the user interactions, as well as ditch, dispatching events to whatever parent component owns it, so the, comparent, the parent component knows, oh, I should refresh data or whatever I'm going to do when it gets dragged past a certain point. It also needs to have some sort of mechanism to start spinning if while, during the loads, while the load's going on, I mean. So we, we need to refactor our latest news component, and that means we have to include our touch-to-drag, uh, touch-drag-to-load <laughs> touch component in the template, uh, and we also need to wire up uh, the event to next into uh, that that refresh on our on our newsfeed service. So here's here's the basic uh, class uh, backing class for our uh, touch drag to load component. What I've done here is I have this refresh event. So in Angular, when you define a, an event, you say it has this output, and you give it an event emitter, and that means that in the template, someone can bind to refresh and pass uh, a method to it that can be called. 
The template looks like this. This is just HTML right now. I'm not doing anything dynamic with, with uh, Angular. This is, so I've got an outer div here that uh, positions it left to right 50%. And then I've got an inner div that's going to be responsible for translating the, the, the icon down, up and down. It's got an offset of negative 35 pixels because I've got a 70 pixel diameter circle that I'm going to use. I'm going to use two circles, one kind of offset inside of the other one. And then my SVG tag here, you notice I've got transform, transform rotate zero degrees. That seems pointless. It's, I have it here because that's what I'm going to use to update the rotation when it's loading. And with my latest news component.html, now what I need to do is I just need to add my touch drag to refresh component. And you see I'm wiring up that refresh event, that output that I, I showed you earlier, to just next on that refresh behavior subject. Now it's actually all wired up. I don't need to do anything else. So as soon as a refresh event comes out of my new component, it's going to call next on uh, my, my refresh behavior subject, which we know triggers the news reload, and we'll update our view. But right now, we haven't wired any of that up. We just put it on the screen. And we can see it's up there. That's my icon. It's just hanging out up there at the top, not doing anything else. But we know it's working. So let's go back and change our touch drag to lo load components uh, template a bit to make it dynamic. So I'm going to have. Uh, Transform the style of that, that second div there to move it up and down. That's gonna, I'm going to have an observable called transform positions that I'm going to pipe out with the pipe async there. I'm going to bind to it. And I'm also going to bind to transform rotates uh, on the second one to, to deal with the rotation part of it. And when we go and we actually look at the component now, I put in the minimal thing I need to do just to get it to work. And that is... Basically, I just took the text right out of that style tag, and I'm saying I have an observable of that text, right, in both cases. And this is the minimal thing I need to do to just have it render. But I really like to deal with numbers, not strings. So I'm going to make my transform positions actually derive from another one called positions that's just an observable of zero. And then I map it, and I'm just using string templates here to, to get the same sort of string out of that. So now if I change zero to something else, it'll change the rotation or the position rather, and I do the same thing for rotation. So if I change you know, that zero and rotates to something else, it's gonna change the rotation of the, the icon. So it still looks exactly the same, I didn't do anything. But again, I'm working my way backwards, I'm just providing, so now I have observables controlling these things at least, but we need to make these observables come from something more interesting. So we've got a slight tweak to this to move the marker off screen. I told you the, the diameter of the circle is uh, 70, so we're going to add neg negative, so we're going to subtract 70 from the position so it moves off the screen because we don't want it to live up there the whole time. We want it to just come down when you pull. Uh, and now let's make touch drags actually affect the position. So you remember before I showed you drag and drop with the mouse down, mouse move. We're going to use this exact same pattern only with touch. And it looks like this. We're saying from event, which is a, a method from Rx. So anytime there's a document touch start, uh, make the, we have this observable of touch starts. Same for touch moves and touch end. And I'm, now I'm going to say for every touch start, I want to map into touch movements and take those until the touch ends. So now I basically have this observable of touch movements, touch movement event objects, really. And I can just include that in my component class, like so. And what I want to do is I want to make my positions actually derive from touch drag. So what I can do is I can just do that. I can just say, OK, there we're going to map y minus 7. There's a, there's a problem with this, because that is an observable of touch events. right? And I can't, sub, or I can't subtract a touch event or 70 from a touch event. That doesn't make any sense. That's not a number, right? So I need to get numbers out of that. And I can do that with a simple mapping up here, where I'm saying, OK, we'll just take the current touch y position and subtract the, the start y position from it. So I get like an offset. Of, so now I have this observable of numbers for the offset of how far I've dragged my finger. And just to kind of just focus in on that a little bit, I got rid of some of the cruft so you can see it. Um, the other thing I've, I'm adding in here is I'm saying I want to start uh, the position with zero down there at the bottom I've added a start with. And that's just to make sure it starts off the screen. Uh, I don't want it to start in some other random spot. So now, when I drag, it follows my drag at the very least. That, that gray dot there is, is my drag, right? So that's, that's not too bad that, it's, that it at least is doing that. But it's not the full feature, right? So let's make it animate home when we let go. That's kind of the next incremental step to making this work. 
So I have a whole talk on RxJS animations. I won't get into that here. Uh, the basic idea is that I get an animation or I get an observable of animation frames, and I do a little math with the offset of when it started and, and the current the current date time to try to figure out like how far it's gonna gone along. And I do some math to be able to tween between two numbers over a certain duration. So tweening meaning like if I start at zero and go to ten over two seconds, then like at one second I get the value five, and you know it. One and a half seconds, I'll get the value 7.5 and so on. So it, it kind of does that for you. I get an observable of numbers. The short version is I have this animation service that has a tween method on it to which I give a start number and an end number and a duration. And it gives me an observable of those of numbers between the start and the end over that duration on animation frame. So now what I want to do, I'm going to go back to my, my uh, touch drags and my positions here, as I want to focus on touch drags, because that's where I'm going to update this. Because really, at the end, like when I get done with the touch moves, that's when I want to play that animation. So when I let go with my finger, like right after touch end there, that's where I want that to happen. So what I can do is I can, well, first of all, I'm going to add a, a property on here called move home. So this is a move home animation that if I subscribe to it, it's going to, it's going to animate home, or in theory. Uh, and I'm just saying tween between the current position, which I've added a private property for, and zero in uh, 0.2 seconds. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to concatenate my touch movements with move home. And what concatenate means is play the first observable till it's done, and then play the next observable. So what I'm saying is do the touch movements until touch ends, and then run my animation. So we've got a little problem, though. We need to update whatever the current position is in some way. There's a bit of state we need to track. So I've added this tap. And what tap does is just say, tap into the observable right here, get the current value, and do something with it. So the side effect I'm doing is I'm just updating uh, that underscore uh, POS. And there's another little problem here in that whenever that move home observable is created, POS is 0. So it's always going to animate between 0 and 0. And that doesn't make any sense. So we need to have it delayed or deferred a bit. And there's Handy enough, there's a, a method in RxJS called defer, which basically says, here's an observable that when you subscribe to it, executes this function, and then subscribes to the observable it returns. So now we should see it, be able to see it move home as soon as I let go, which is pretty fun by itself, honestly, when you're playing with it. Um, but we want it to load, right? So let's make it refresh the feed if we get far enough. So we're going to go back to our touch drags here, because we're going to need to do something with this, uh, because it depends on how far you've dragged, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another tap down here at the bottom, where I'm saying, OK, if y happens to be greater than half of the inner height, so if I drag it more than halfway, then I want you to call emit on refresh. So refresh, if you remember, is the name of our event on this component. And when you call emit, it emits a value out to the template where we bound out refresh to update to call next on that subject. It calls next on the subject, which triggers the, the news feed to reload. So this should be all that's really required, with the exception of we don't want it doing that over and over and over again, right? Because tap is, that's going to fire for every single time y is greater than the, the inner window height. So I'm just going to add a take while right after that. It says, but only take this while y is uh, less than or equal to half the window height. Right? So as soon as you go over that once, it's going to trigger that emit. And then it's gonna, the whole observable is going to stop. So now, you can pull it down a little bit, and it animates back. But you pull it down far enough, and voila, we've got uh, it, it actually loads, reloads the data. But then it gets stuck there, which is not what we want. After it reloads the data, we want it to animate back. So let's have it go home after the, load, after the load's finished. And some of that work's already done. We already have a move home animation observable, right? So what we're going to do here is now I'm going to focus on positions. So we're not going to deal with touch drags anymore. I'm going to go back down here to positions. And I need to have the positions actually update from more than just touch drags, because no one's touching at this point. Whenever, whenever the load finishes, you're done touching the, the screen. It's, it needs to, something else needs to trigger that. So I'm going to have this move home after load observable. And what I'm going to do is say, hey, whenever I get news back from load news, Remember I was sharing that before? That's the actual HTTP request, the shared HTTP request. When that comes back, I'm going to map that into my moved home animation, and I'm going to wait for that animation to complete before I allow it to happen again. That's what exhaust map does. And then I need to take move home after load and touch drags and combine them in some way to update positions. 
And uh, what I'm going to do there is I'm going to say, I'm going to concatenate these together. So I'm saying take touch drags, and whenever touch drags is done, then start uh, move the, the move home after load observable. That's going to wait until load, load news is done, and then it's going to play the animation. And that also means I need to have positions up, like position updates feed into positions. So now we've got it, and it works, but it only works one time. It's kind of a bummer. It was really exciting when it worked the first time, but we want it to work more than once. And uh, it's actually a really easy fix. So what happened here is concat, as I stated before, plays an observable till it ends, and then it plays the next observable till it ends, and then it ends, right? So everything we just wrote happened one time and then it's done. So we need to have, have it happen more than once. And so then we just add repeat on there. And that's, that is a feature of RxJS. And this is because observables are lazy. You can simply subscribe to them again when they're done. That's all repeat does internally. And as soon as we do that, it works. So as soon as the, the, we can do it more than once and it's, it's fine. But it's boring because it doesn't spin, right? What would, be, what would be driving through the streets of India without honking? We need, we need some spinning to, to make this more exciting. Let's make this sucker spin. All right, so we've got, we're, we're going to go back to our rotate. So we've kind of forgotten about this for now because we're dealing with the position. But we'll go back to rotate. We want to update rotates to not be an observable of zero. We want it to be something more exciting. So we can do animations and we can tween between zero and 360 degrees over the course of half a second. And that's going to make it go around once. But we want it to go around over and over again. So guess what we're going to use? Our friend repeat. And now it's going to spin uh, infinitely. So we can check it out just because it's fun. <laughs> it's spinning. It always spins. Probably better that way, honestly. But uh, <laughs> we'll leave it like that. We only want it to spin while it's loading. So here's what we're going to do to make it spin only while it's loading. Uh, I'm actually going to say whenever someone calls next on refresh, I'm also going to have it map into my animation of, of spinning. So as soon as someone calls next on refresh, it's going to start spinning. Uh, and then the other thing is I've got to have it stop whenever uh, the, the, the news data comes in. So I just say take until news feed load news. So load news uh, fires when the, the data resolves, right? When it comes back from the, the server. And then the other thing I'm going to add here is end with zero. And end with zero is just because if it's spinning around like this and the data comes back while it's down kind of crooked, then it's going to be stuck there until the next time it starts spinning again. So I'm, I just wanted to jump back to zero so it's, it's in a nice clean spot. And that's it. Our feature's added. Um, but it seems like a lot because I've been standing up here talking and my mouth's getting dry and people are looking bored or looking like, what is this guy talking about? It's crazy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's the entire feature. And the reason, the reason I went over this is, is because, again, we're coordinating user events, data load, animations. Uh, I really wish I had time to get into the animation side of it because it's really exciting. You get to use math and do nerdy geometry things, which is fun. Um, but the most important thing is that entire behavior, even though I stood up here and talked about it for a while to explain all of it, it was only about 50 lines of code, like the whole thing, end to end. And I roughly guarantee you that if you were trying to do that imperatively, it would be a lot more code than that. And it would be buggy, and there would be, you wouldn't get the deterministic memory management that you get out of RxJS with the guaranteed teardowns and everything. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I like this, this particular example. So in summary, uh, RxJS is best used for coordinating events. If you're just clicking a button and loading data, please don't use RxJS. I, I write the library. I love people that use it. Don't use RxJS for everything. You don't need RxJS for your Hello World app. That's crazy. Uh, whenever you're working on it, try to work backwards. So provide the observable that makes it work first, and then figure out where you need to get those pieces from and combine those observables to make that observable, and so on and so forth. Just kind of work your way back. Um, if you ever need to create an observable dynamically, this is a weird thing that comes up, and Angular developers ask me about this sometimes. It's like, oh, you know, I had this situation where I had this observable, and I thought I was creating it like properly, but I need to create it on the fly. There's this cool method called defer that I think is underused in, in Rx. And there's also this pattern with repeat. So 
it's, it's harder to see in here, but basically, if you compose a whole observable that you think, oh, I don't ever want this to end, I, I really like it. Um, like, and, and then there's some sort of terminal thing, like it loads data and it's done. Uh, and you want, it to, you want it to come back out, you've got to take while it stops or something, you can just repeat and guess what, the whole process starts over again, it's fine. So take while repeats a, an interesting pattern that, that was visible in here. And then the other thing you want to do is try to factor out your observables into other things. So for example, I had that, uh, I had one property that was like transform rotate and another one that was called rotates, right? And another one for move home. Like don't just make one big observable that, that is just like a giant thing. Think of RxJS as a domain specific language for dealing with events. If you have one giant observable chain, it's like the same thing as writing a giant function. And we all know that's bad. At least I hope most of us know that's bad, right? Um, so you can break it apart into smaller pieces, into smaller observables, and it also makes it easier to test. So that's it. Uh, I'm open for questions. The, the repository for this is, is uh, available here at the bottom, and you're welcome to go check it out. Um, you can find me on Twitter, at Ben Lesh.